It's good to see each and every one of you, and I hope that you'll be able to gain something from the things that we're going to be undertaking tonight as they coincide, actually, with what we were discussing Tuesday morning in connection with the Hutterites. These groups of people have all been attributed to this group of people, primarily as we've already discussed, with the, those that have been noted as the Anabaptist. You have that particular group, and from that basically have stemmed these other groups that we have talked about. Mennonites have been discussed. We talked about the Hutterites then Tuesday morning and then talk about the Amish this evening. They are all similar in uh, most ways, and yet you will see their peculiarities that you'll have to each one of these particular groups. As I also pointed out Tuesday morning, one of the things that we're going to have to do since we are and have broken up this particular series of thought, and especially for those that may not have been here Tuesday morning or have heard some of these other, other lessons that are attributed to things concerning the Anabaptists, and for those that may be viewing on the DVDs and have not seen some of the others to have the context, we need to establish context for whatever it is that we're going to be discussing. So those that view it might be able to know. So just very briefly bear with us as we go through just a little bit of this again so we have some of that context. Keep in mind that during this particular period of time in the early 1500s that Catholicism is your primary source of rule. Now you have to take into account the fact that even those that were kings, even those that were members of parliaments, they had all been baptized into the Catholic Church. Every one of them were in that condition. As a consequence of this, then that means the Pope has it's his most powerful sway on all of those that are in these positions. Now, you had kings that were trying to buck the system. We talked a little bit about that last night and this morning as well. And while there are those that were trying to do it, it's still the case that even though you've got a king that's trying to upset the apple cart and go his own way, the pope still has the power to excommunicate the man, and many of them would. Now, of course, you're in the situation like you are, as we talked about with Henry VIII in about the 1530s, then uh, when he, of course, is married to Catherine of Aragon and he's only had a daughter by her, he's wanting a male heir and she's not able to produce and he's wanting Anne Boleyn and he's going to try to divorce Catherine of Aragon and the Catholic Church is not going to allow, allow him to do it. Well, he is determined that he's going to have Anne Boleyn and so he separates himself from the Catholic Church to marry her. It didn't work out. She was pregnant three or four times but had miscarriages every occasion. So he just continues to marry and marry and marry and there you're seeing a situation where ultimately there is this separation from the church but even that didn't last really all that long when you think about the the monarchy of England, even though the church of, of England remained, the Anglican church remained, you had his daughter come into power, Bloody Mary. She was pure Catholic, and she was wanting to try to restore Catholicism, and she was killing everybody she could who wasn't going to agree with. The one reprieve that they had from her is the fact I think she had brain cancer and died fairly soon. And so as a consequence of this, then her illegitimate sister Elizabeth I came to the throne and she was a Protestant. So that began to open up the door to a lot of those that in fact might be reformers or otherwise. So there's a whole lot of things that were going on, especially where the kings were concerned. But if in fact that they were going to try to work against the Pope, he at least was able to dangle excommunication over them in order for him to be able to bring them back into the order that he wanted. Now one of the primary forces that he had over the entire population of the world at that time that had access to the religion at all, I suppose you might say, was the fact that they were able to keep the scriptures from all the basic population. The laity was not allowed to have access to it. Now you have to take into account by the time that you're coming into the 1500s, the Catholic Church has been in existence for the better part of a thousand years if you're going to count the time when Boniface I comes the first of the popes. And from that time until this time right here, you're seeing them develop and really come to the point where they have mastered the concept of the correlation that exists between religious and political power. 
And that has also translated itself into military power. But now you're looking at a situation where they're keeping the Word of God from being able to be understood, read, and appreciated by those of the population. Till which time, you, know, you had some like Wycliffe, as we talked about, Tyndale and Coverdale and some of the others that would provide translations. And don't you know that whenever it was that Gutenberg built the press, they were ready to strangle that man because of the fact that he began to make available to the public during that time the printed forms of the translations. And now the people then have access to it, and now that they're able to see it, they have understood that what they've been sold is a bill of goods, all for the purpose of the power, the money, the religious, the political power, the military power to the Catholic Church. Now that they come to this, and they have some understanding about it, there's a couple of issues that stand out with them. Number one is the issue regarding infant baptism. Now the reason why that that becomes a primary issue, there are four reasons why that they were baptized as infants. Number one, let's just say, for example, that you may have been born in Warsaw, Poland. Let's just use that one. That was a heavily concentrated area of Catholicism as well. When you're born there and you're going to be baptized into the Catholic Church, they're going to make a record of that. Your name is going to be put on a citizenship roll with your birth date. And that's going to be observed consistently because, number two, that name is also going to be put on the tax rolls when that individual becomes productive and they're keeping up with your age. Number three, if you happen to be a male, your name is going to be put now on conscript list. When all of this happens when you're baptized as a male, your name is also being put on a conscript list so that when in fact they are able to check your age and if the government and where it is that you're living happens to enter into a military campaign, and there's not enough or sufficient soldiers to be able to carry out that campaign, they're going to draft those that are conscripts in and put you into the war. But number four is your primary reason. Primary reason for infant baptism is to make each and every individual a member of the Catholic Church. This was what was forced upon all those people during that time. And this is where much of those who began to read the Scriptures began to understand that is not what the Scriptures teach. And so you had many of those, like we have seen and introduced already, Conrad Grobel and Felix Manns and George Blaurock, some of these others who rebaptized or baptized themselves as adults and made the proclamation among themselves that if in fact we're going to comply with what is truth as far as the scriptures are concerned, this is only those that in fact that are going to be candidates for baptism are those that have the capacity to be able to believe and respond to what the gospel commands are going to be. This is not something that is obviously or biblical obvious to those that are infants. This, this is something that they cannot do. Another one of the problems that they had as well is we also introduced regarding the matter of the Hutterites. And this is one of all, of course, all of them coming from this very same source. They one of the primary objections that they had was the rule that the Catholic Church had over all aspects of society. So they also were going to recall themselves, remove themselves, separate themselves unto their own authority. So they were separating themselves from the power that not only the governments would have, but also the powers that would be under the, the auspices of the Roman Catholic religion. Now, what this would do once they made this separation, as obvious as you would think, the Catholic Church is going to view them as heretics. Now, we use that terminology rather loosely when we speak of it, but they didn't. If you are a heretic, you're against the Pope, you're against the King, you're against the status quo. 
Consequently, you are worthy of either torture or jail or death. As a result of the establishment of this group here, they are termed as heretics. And what they did, those among the Catholics and the Reformers commissioned a group of people that they called the Anabaptist Hunters. Now, you remember us talking about a little bit about the Hutterites of the day and also the Mennonites as they've discussed that. How that they had to move from place to place because of persecution. There's a primary reason why. Because when the kings or some of the magistrates found that some of these Anabaptist individuals were in particular areas and they began to realize that they were flourishing in these areas and knowing, as also Brother Mark brought out to our attention last night, some of the groups did not altogether subscribe to some of the edicts that these particular groups had established, one being pacifism. And some of them didn't do that. So they were willing to take up the sword. That's what got the attention of most of the others, of those that were the leaders. If, in fact, that, that particular group or this particular group is going to take up the sword, then we're going to assume that these rest, the rest of them are. So they're posed as, or positioned as a threat. And so as a consequence of this, these Anabaptist hunters are sent out to find them they find many of them from the time when this movement begins in about 1525, when they had that rebaptism situation that took place up in Zurich in 1525. From that time till about 1529, these Anabaptist hunters had caught and either tried and tortured or killed about 4,000 of these Anabaptist people. Now that has a little bit of effect on the mentality of these people. Now among the leaders... This is something that instills with them a little bit more determination to try to uphold what it is that they're doing and to try to further the cause. But now if you're one of the followers, not to say that the leaders weren't being persecuted, they were, but then also you take into account that the rest of the followers who have also their families who are being affected by the persecution, they begin to wonder as to why it is or if in fact we should continue in this cause. So the interest of it began to wane a bit, and the uh, effort to evangelize, to try to get people to move into this movement, was also the fact that that uh, was not so appealing. There were not too many people that were wanting to be part of this, realizing the reputation that they had for being persecuted as a consequence of following after those that had established this particular movement. Now, you had a group of people, as they began to move about different places, trying to find areas where they could settle and at least flourish. You had some that had gone up into the area of Holland. Now some of these, as you're coming now about 11 years into the movement now, about 1536, there's the group that we were talking about last night under the leadership of Mino Simons, that here among the Mennonites, they found some reprieve in dealing with those of the Dutch community. Now you have to keep in mind something. This is kind of ironic because they're still highly influenced. Most of the, all of these people are still Catholic or some of the reformers. But evidently we've walked into a group of people here that are more liberal minded. They're not the dogmatic Catholics and reformers evidently that much of you will find in some of the other nations around him. They became more tolerant of them during this time. And in fact, the matter is, when indeed that there may be some of the Anabaptist hunters that would be coming into the area trying to find them, that some of these Dutch neighbors here would hide them and inter even intervene for them on occasion to keep them from being harmed. And those that were followers of Mino Simons during this time, those we would just simply refer to the Mennonites at this particular point, and we just include them all in this at this time, he uh, evidently has talked to some of those among the, the Dutch neighbors and made it clear to them evidently, look, we're not a threat to anybody. We're not here to harm anybody. We just want to be able to free, be free to do what it is that we do and uphold the things that we believe. Well, those among the Dutch evidently were sympathetic toward that and so allowed them in that area. Now, the only problem 
that comes as a result of this. They, of course, the Mennonites would eventually refer to these people as they're the true hearted. So they thought a lot of them. They got along quite well. But what it did, it also caused among this group of Mennonites a discussion among themselves about their true hearted neighbors, those Dutch people. And the discussion has to do with the fact, well, I just wonder whether or not they're saved. And the discussion had to do with it along the line, if in fact they are saved on the basis of their infant baptism, where does that put our adult baptism? What kind of conditions that put us in? If they're saved on the basis of their infant baptism, then our baptism doesn't mean anything. So they have a little problem in their minds about this. They debated this back and forth and back and forth, but they come to a simple solution. They come to the realization, look, these people, the Dutch neighbors are helping us out. They're not against us. They're not trying to hurt us. They're helping to take care of us. So let's just forget it. Uh, we were, not, we're not going to judge on that matter. We'll just leave it up to God to judge on that, and that's what happened. So they continued to coexist in the fashion that they did for quite some time. But then a problem comes from that. Because now from this, this group of people are beginning and they're more interaction with their Dutch neighbors who were in fact not all that dedicated evidently to Catholicism or the Reformation. If they had been, they would have run these people off. So they are living fairly loose as far as their lives are concerned, and these Mennonites begin to also adapt a little bit to that same lifestyle. So their spirituality begins to plummet, and the numbers begin to plummet, as also Brother Mark brought out last night as well. Now then, enter into the scene a fellow by the name of Jacob Amon. When he discovers, now you're looking at a little bit of later time now, you're coming about 60 years later, you're in the 1690s at this particular point, and he has seen at this time the absolute decay of this movement. The lack of spirituality that exists, the lack of attention to the original decrees, the confession that had been established, their articles of confession, all of that is something that has basically been thrown out the window for the most part, and he staunchly objects. And so his effort, as to quote some that have uh, researched him, was to reinvigorate their spiritual life and to reinvigorate the church life that had been initially established when they broke off from Catholicism back in 1525. And one of the things he saw, he knew that, of course, what they were doing at that time, based on what I've been able to understand, they were taking the Lord's Supper one time a year. And he was able to recognize, evidently, that at least in the time period following this or in and about the period when they would take the Lord's Supper, they were more spiritual minded at that particular point, but it's only once a year. So he had some sense of the idea that that is something that had some influence on their spiritual behavior, but they're only doing it once a year. So he at least proposed, let's double that. <laughs> we'll do it twice. Now that's still as well you, as well you know as well as I do that that's still 50 Sundays short of what the Bible is going to teach. Upon the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, continued to speech to midnight. Acts 20 and 7 is one of the reasons, along with the other acts of worship, that the brethren would come together to do, and that is what is established in the Scriptures. Well, we're short here, but nevertheless, it's a step in the right direction. But... He runs head on into a Swiss elder by the name of Hans Reist, who, when this proposal is made, looks at Jacob Amman and says, all you're wanting to do is just make a change for the sake of changing. And he opposes it and is not willing to accept it nor present it as being something that they should do. Well, that frustrates Amman, number one. Number two... Amon also recognizes the spiritual laxity that exists among this community of, 
of believers among the Anabaptists here, and he understands exactly why it is that this is occurring. It's because of the fact that they were not practicing one of the initial articles, and that was to separate themselves from those among the world. And they were interacting with them. So he's suggesting to them, we need to go back to practicing this concept of separation. And Hans Reist was not willing to do that either. In fact, the matter is, he made a point from Matthew chapter 15 and 11, it's not what goes in your mouth, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles the man. What he's basically saying concerning those that were his Dutch neighbors, they haven't done anything as far as we're concerned that we would see as being defiling of us. So his intention was he wasn't going to practice this principle of separation. Well, now Amon has enough in his estimation to carry this to the council of those that would be leaders among this group. And so they have a little meeting, and they decide to set up a debate. And they had a debate between Jacob Amon and Hans Rice. They had it at a, a barn that was owned by a friend of Rice whose name was Nicholas Moser. I've seen the picture of that barn, it's a huge barn. And evidently there were several numbers of folks that also attended that debate. I'm not going to get all into all what involved here to start with, but there was evidently on that first day of that debate significant amount of argumentum ad hominem. Just simply meaning that they were throwing bad names one after the other at each other. It was a lot of heated antagonism and it finally came to the point then the second day of the debate, the debate went on for 14 days, if you call it that, because the second day Hans Rice and his immediate followers didn't even show up. Well, Jacob Amon continued to argue his case, and there were those that were some of his Rice followers that tried to also argue, but it just, they were not able to make any headway here. And it finally came to the point that Amon called Rice and his followers heretics. Now you got to think again about that term because every one of them sitting in that barn were referred to as heretics by the Catholic Church. They knew what that meant. And now Amon is calling another portion of his own group here, those that are supposed to be fellow believers, as heretics. And these people were absolutely horrified. They tried to reconcile but it didn't work. The group split. So now you got Mennonites. Now you got the followers of Jacob Amon. Now you have the Amish. Now they're going to go through a good bit of migration themselves in certain areas. They would stay some in Holland, moving different areas, but eventually they're going to find themselves coming to America. Most of them are going to start with going to be settling in the areas of Pennsylvania. You'll see them all over the place now. Their communities are established, of course, basically by number. Congregations established by number. And so this is, in fact, how it is. That, 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 that plays a little bit of role on how they conduct their work and worship as the size of their communities. Because if a congregation gets too large, they break off and make another one. And here is how all of this works as well. Their belief system is interesting. They have two primary foundational beliefs that, that are incorporated to be incorporated into their personal disposition. One of them is called the Hockmut, the other is called the Golosenheit. Now the Golosenheit is actually based upon what you'll find in the Hockmut. The Hockmut is just simply a concept which suggests, and in fact it demands that those that are of the Amish persuasion must never display any sense of pride or arrogance. They're always to present themselves in humility. Now that plays a role in the Glossenheit. Because if in fact
seen any of these people. You've probably heard of it. You've probably seen it on the news. You may have seen it displayed in movies and things of this nature where there are Amish communities and you'll have some that come into town possibly to pick up their supplies and you've always got some rogues somewhere or another who want to try to antagonize them. So they're going to call them names or maybe throw at them, throw things at them and things of this nature. And yet you will see that the Amish will try to remain calm and have a placid demeanor. That is supposed to be characteristic of their dispositions. Now this also plays some role in the way they conduct themselves in worship and otherwise. Their worship is interesting based upon, again, their community size. Most of these people have to have a fair size house in which to dwell because one of the things about the communities is that in every one of these Amish communities, when they have a worship service, they meet in a different home of this particular community every week. And that again depends upon the size of the congregation itself as to how many times they may meet in your home a year. Maybe once, maybe twice. But outside of that, if it gets any larger than that, then they're going to break off and they'll make another, another congregation of this group. They are led, they have the setup of their ministry is based upon the concept you've got a bishop that oversees a congregation. Now those that are familiar with what the Bible teaches in that respect realize the error. Even like when Paul had sent uh, Titus to Crete to establish the, and put to ordain elders in those congregations, every occasion when you see the New Testament speaking of those that are elders of congregations, it's never as one, but always in the plural. The congregations by ordination, what we find within the Scriptures must have at least two or more. This is not something in harmony that you're finding here. You've got one bishop that oversees the religious activity and takes care of all the religious matters that exist within that congregation. Then you have a minister. He's responsible for all the worship. Then you have some deacons that take care of the collections, and they're the ones that take care of the band, the, the matters of discipline that might occur. They're the ones responsible for all of that. When they come together to worship, they use uh, the Amish hymnal called the Osman. Your minister usually directs this, this singing. The, the Osborne is done in evidently high German as I understand it, and the way that they work these hymns is kind of like Gregorian chants. What you have is the minister will have a particular song in front of him, and it'll have a particular melody that they, with which they are familiar, and what he will do is he will sing off a phrase with a particular melody, and then the congregation will simply repeat that phrase. Then you go to the next phrase, he will sing that, then they will repeat that phrase. And they will go through the songs. Then after whichever, how many songs they've selected, they have a prayer, and then they have two sermons. You have a deacon that's going to present one, and then the minister's going to tell us the next one. So that is basically your worship service. Now if you start looking into their belief system, it is quite similar to all the others that we have talked about among the Hutterites, among the Mennonites, because all of this was established with those initial articles of confession that they had established. And they're all familiar to us. They believe that there is one God, and the God is, is triune. He's the Father, Son, the Spirit. They believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came in the flesh, and died, was buried, resurrected, was resurrected again the third day interesting thing about their concept on salvation. If you're looking at the outline, you'll notice that it, one of the things that they, and this is taken exactly from the material from which I uh, uh, received this and was studying it. Salvation comes through grace by faith. In other, in other words, a little bit of a turnaround of the language that we find in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, which was discussed a few minutes ago by Brother Garland, very eloquently. I would suggest that these people don't know too much about the idea of grace. In fact, the matter is, there are very few within the 
denominational world, if any at all, understand the concept of the grace of God. In fact, there are many people in the, the body of Christ who don't understand much about the grace of God. If you're going to look at the statement, in fact, in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, if somebody really wants to know and understand precisely what that's discussing, if you look in the context of Ephesians chapter 2, you're going to see that the Apostle Paul is trying to establish to these people who are in Ephesus the value of how it is that Christ actually brings salvation and how that that something is achieved by obedience to the gospel. That is the context of this. You who were far off are now made nigh by what? Blood of Christ. How is it that they were made, how was that made known to them? Did he not mention in the next few verses that we came and preached what? Peace to you. We preach this gospel of peace to you. That is what is also meant in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. If you want a commentary on that, just as Brother Garland brought up a moment ago, you look at Titus, Titus chapter 2, 11 and 12 and look at the text. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared, epiphyano. It's been manifest. How? By virtue of what you see back over at Ephesians 2, you're able to comprehend what was manifested. What was it? What is the free gift? For by grace, Christ, are you saved through faith. The truth. That is what that's discussing. And that's what most people have a difficulty in understanding. These people never have gotten it. Many of our own have not gotten it. That is the context of what he's discussing in Ephesians chapter 2. Now the reason why that becomes important to this particular issue is because when you look at the statement that they have made that salvation is through grace by faith, you start looking at some of their other materials who have some that have researched the issue and have discussed this with some of their preachers, their proclamation is that salvation is by grace only. So that is something that they do adapt more to the concept of Calvinistic doctrine in that respect. They believe that the Scripture is divinely inspired of God. They believe the church is the body of Christ. And then you start looking at some of their primary teachings that they emphasize. They really place a great deal of, of emphasis upon the teachings of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. They submitting oneself to the will of God, which is certainly emphasized. And then you're looking at something else, the submission to authority. The reason I'm bringing that to your, your attention because that's somewhat ironic. When you look at the idea that's expressed there to submit to authority, well, I begin to think on that for just a minute. And I go back to 1525. What was their authority when they broke away from Catholicism? They're also not submitting, basically, as we understand it, to the authorities of the local governments. Their, their intention is to submit, you look at the statement there, to authority, and it qualifies it, to the faith community. In other words, the authority to which we uphold and abide by is given to us by the bishop of our community or the chief elder of our community. And they would simply uphold, I'm sure as we would, but with a little bit more, I suppose you might say, uh, distinction, in the statement that uh, Peter made in Acts 5, we obey God rather than men. And this to the extent that they would simply dismiss essentially what's found in Romans chapter 13. If there's going to be submission to any authority, it's the one that they established themselves. They, in fact, also have some problems with the idea. You know, you've talk, we've talked a little bit about their belief in the assurance of salvation and the like. The pride element, remember again, the principle that we talked about a minute ago, they were not, according to the Hakmat, ever to display or and somehow articulate the sense of pride or arrogance. And for anyone to say that they knew that they were saved, 
that was an indication that they were in violation of the Hakmat. And so that's the reason why some of them would just simply say, we cannot proclaim that we know that we're saved, but by virtue of what we know that we have done, we can say that we have a living hope. Now that in and of itself, we might say, is it somewhat acceptable? Because when you take into account the statement that is made in Mark the 16th chapter, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The word saved from sozo meaning safe. And so we are and do have as children of God, a living hope. But I also have confidence of the fact that I'm a saved individual. How about you? Is it not the fact that uh, the Apostle John stated in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28 that at the time when our Lord's coming, we ought to be able to have confidence before Him at His coming and not be ashamed? Well, there's where you're able to see, ladies and gentlemen, some of the differences that we have but these people play, have played a very significant role during the course of our history. They still play significant roles in local areas now. They're dependent upon by many because of their significant amount of capacity to work with their industrially and their industrial works that they're able to perform. I'm talking about all of these uh, groups. You're talking about the Hutterites, the Mennonites, and the Amish. They are magnificent industrial individuals. Their handiworks are absolutely par beyond none. I mean, they, they have very few peers in that respect. And one of the things that we're able to learn from them, at least, as we pointed out the other day from the Hutterites, is the resilience of these people. I don't know if we'll ever face anything like what they have or not. I hope we don't. But the fact of the matter is we are not really certain as to <laughs> what's coming tomorrow. Our anticipation is that things will continue to exist in the freedoms that we have presently. But if things don't change, you begin to wonder. If in fact, as, as to Arnold Toynbee pointed out in his works on Western civilization some years ago, Civilization on Trial, I think is the name of it, and he had pointed out that there were some, from the beginning of time, that there were some 21 major empires from the beginning of time, the time that he writes that work. And at the time he was writing, there were only 19 of them that have stood. One of them was the Soviet Union, and the other was the United States of America. Since then, the Soviet Union has fallen as a major empire. The United States remains to be the only major power when you think of it from that standpoint. And then he made this comment that if, in fact, the people of the United States don't make their turn away from their immorality and turn to morality, they're destined to fall just like the rest. Now, what's going to happen if that occurs? Where shall we be? Who will take over? And what, in fact, will become of us? We're going to have to make some tough decisions if that's the case. And in my estimation, those decisions need to be made prior to the fall in order to keep the fall from happening. These people right here were resilient even in their error. They were searching for truth, never quite got there, but they are very close. But still it is the case they're not there yet. It's amazing to me that there are those of us that come to the realization that we do have it, and we take it for granted, don't we? We just assume everything is going to continue as it is, and we live our comfortable, cushy little lives, and we make no effort whatsoever to see to it that those that are dying in sin never have a hope at all. And in fact, that there are those that so many that have adhered to all of these particular doctrines that are foreign from the truth, and we just simply observe a Passover with them and never really take the time to stand against those things and help these people come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, perhaps. Learning from the resilience of these people Maybe we'll to learn the concepts of humility. Perhaps we will learn the concept that we should abide by something like they have done, not to display pride or arrogance, 
but yet have the same determination to uphold the truth and be confident when the Lord returns. Are you confident this evening? If the Lord is to return, and we know not when it shall be, how confident are you? Now, as that sinks in, we begin now to examine ourselves for just a moment and begin to think about our relationship to the God of heaven. How that He has loved us to such an extent that He sent His Son so that we might have that hope and that the hope can be eventually realized. But as was stated also very eloquently by Brother Garland, this terms or these terms of the grace of God have been so proclaimed, but it requires man's response. If you want to partake of what the Lord offers, then take what He offers by faith, knowing that it's going to help you to be saved. Willingness to turn away from sin, to walk in the path of Christ, to reject sin, and now to be willing to confess with the mouth that Jesus is the Christ. Your acknowledging of Him is also that which makes you candidate for being baptized into Christ. And upon that baptism you are born again and born into the kingdom of Christ, the church about which you read in the New Testament. You are a saved one, having as living safety until which time that you die, if you die faithful, you'll be able to enjoy the presence of God through eternity. But perhaps if you've done those things and somehow have sinned so as to reproach the name of God and His kingdom, then you need to reconcile with Him and your brethren. We sing a song to encourage you, and it will show up on the board, and we will sing it and be here to help and assist if that need does exist. So won't you, if you need to, while we stand, while we sing it.